Okay, so we come to our last talk of our symposium, certainly not the least exciting because I'm so happy to have Dr. Tara Justice here. Um, Dr. Justice did her uh, OBGYN residency at UBC, and she was the recipient of the Hamilton Wadman Award in her final year. And then she did a fellowship in pediatric and adolescent gynecology in Calgary. So Dr. Justice works uh, at BC Children's Hospital doing peds gyne. And then she also works in Fraser Health, working with um, adult gynecological patients and children at Surrey Memorial and Amara Women's Clinic. Um, and Dr. Justice is active with the UBC Department of uh, OBGYN as a clinical assistant professor. Uh, very happy to have you here, Dr. Justice, to talk about managing irregular cycles in the young female patient. And I'll ask you to go ahead and share your screen. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Dr. Dan, for the introduction. Um, and before we get started today, I would just start with a land acknowledgement. And I would like to begin by acknowledging that we live, work, and play on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations from where I'm presenting in Vancouver today. I give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, and support care here. So in developing the objectives for my talk today, I asked my friend's husband, uh, I told him I was doing a talk on managing periods and teenagers, and his advice was Taylor Swift, chocolate and talking about your feelings. Um, but our goals today are to understand normal menstrual cycle patterns in early adolescence, review some of the underlying etiologies for irregular periods and secondary amenorrhea, develop an approach to workup for the adolescent patient, and provide an overview of some of the possible treatment options and the things we should be considering when managing these patients. So these are two patients that you might encounter in your practice day to day. Patient number one is a 13 year old who went through menarche in July of 2023, and they've had irregular periods since menarche, sometimes having two periods in a month, other times skipping a period. Patient number two is a 17-year-old who went through menarche in July of 2019, and they're having heavy periods approximately every four to six months. So let's review a few definitions. Well, what is our definition of an irregular menstrual cycle? So to us as gynecologists, an irregular menstrual cycle is a menstrual cycle length, so that means from first day of one period to the first day of the next period that is either less than 21 days or more than 35 days. Alternatively, it's defined as having less than eight cycles per year. And it's important to appreciate this definition as our patient's definition of an irregular period may differ from ours. And a lot of my teenage patients particularly call their periods irregular when it doesn't come exactly on the same day every month. And so it's important to tease this apart in our history taking. Our other definition is secondary amenorrhea. And so this refers to patients who have had periods previously, who then have no period for a length of time equal to three of their previous cycles, or have no periods over a span of six months. So let's go back to medical school. Well, what do we need to have a period? Well, the first thing we need is to have a functional hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So we have our hypothalamus at the top that's releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. This is traveling down to our anterior pituitary where it acts on our gonadotroph cells leading to the secretion of FSH and LH, which are then acting on our ovary to produce estrogen and progesterone 
which are providing negative feedback to the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. We also need to have normal uterovaginal anatomy. So that means having a uterus with a functional endometrium that responds to our estrogen and progesterone, and also means not having something obstructing the outflow of blood so that their period comes out each month. And so what's exactly happening at the level of the ovary? So to review our menstrual cycle, day zero is the onset of menses. And uh, in the first half of our cycle, which we call our follicular phase or proliferative phase, our ovary is under the control of FSH that's being secreted by the anterior pituitary. This is leading to development of a dominant follicle that will hopefully ovulate. And our ovary is beginning to secrete estrogen in rising levels throughout that first half of our cycle. This leads to our endometrial lining proliferating and growing under the effect of that estrogen. In a regular cycle, ovulation occurs approximately 14 days in. And when we ovulate, we leave behind our corpus luteum within the ovary. And the corpus luteum's job is to secrete progesterone. Our progesterone works to stabilize our endometrial lining, putting it in a more of a secretory phase. But our corpus luteum only has a lifespan of approximately 14 days. And so if there's no pregnancy, after those 14 days, our corpus luteum dies, our progesterone levels fall, and this is what signals the onset of our period. In our patients who do not have ovulation occur during their cycles, this leads to continued growth of the endometrial lining under the effect of estrogen, and they don't have a corpus luteum making progesterone to help stabilize that lining. And so these patients have cycles that go one of two ways. Either they have cycles that are spread really far apart uh, because there's nothing signaling for the onset of their period, or they have cycles that are really close together because their endometrial lining is quite fragile without the progesterone and they get bits and pieces of it breaking off leading to frequent bleeding. So what happens right after menarche? Well, you know, like all things growing up, things take a little while to be done correctly. And so we refer to this as the immature hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And we know that it takes a few years in order for our HPO axis to work slick. And so we know that it takes a few years for our teenage patients to be consistently ovulating. So in the first two years after menarche, approximately 55 to 82% of our cycles are actually anovulatory. And with more time, more of our cycles become ovulatory. So by three years, only 50% are anovulatory. And by five years, we're down to 10 to 20%. We also know that depending what age you went through menarche affects how fast your HPO axis will mature. So maybe the opposite of what we would expect, but if you've gone through menarche earlier, usually you will achieve regular ovulatory cycles quicker than someone who's gone through menarche later, where it can take even four to five years before most cycles are ovulatory. And so along this pattern, after menarche, we expect over the ensuing years that more cycles become ovulatory and our menstrual cycle lengths become more regular. But overall, kind of, you know, one of the take homes that the peds gynees would love for you to all take home today are that menstrual cycles can be irregular for up to three years after a menarche. And when we're seeing patients with irregular menstrual cycles in our clinic, we're stratifying them by this three year rule with our investigations and level of concern differing depending which side of this they fall. So what are our possible etiologies for irregular cycles in secondary amenorrhea? Well, we can take an anatomic approach, looking at disorders from the very top of our HPO axis in the hypothalamus through the pituitary and the ovaries, as well as disorders of the genital outflow tract. Always remembering to rule out pregnancy if this is a possibility in your patient. However, 
you know, the purpose of our talk today is to talk about irregular periods and secondary amenorrhea in adolescence. And disorders of the genital outflow tract are quite rare in this setting. Our patients who have congenital anomalies would have presented with primary amenorrhea. And uh, patients with secondary amenorrhea, you know, who have genital outflow tract anomalies, this is often secondary to instrumentation of their uterus. So they've had scarring or otherwise known as Asherman syndrome from repeated intrauterine procedures, or they have cervical stenosis from previous uh, treatment for either abnormal pap smears or other etiologies. And the likelihood of our patients having this in adolescence is quite low. And so we're not gonna discuss disorders of the genital outflow tract today. But starting from the top at our hypothalamus, we know that hypothalamic dysfunction is one of the most common causes of irregular periods. And the hypothalamus is quite sensitive. And the level of disturbance and how thrown off the periods are um, is really a reflection of how much the gonadotropin secretion is suppressed. And so the typical stressors we think of for our hypothalamus are eating disorders, excessive exercise, or emotional stressors. And we're seeing more and more emotional stressors these days, either due to familial problems, relationship problems, or patients who are high achievers and stressed by academic pursuits and post-secondary education. The pattern that we often see with these patients is that they have altered GnRH secretion by the hypothalamus, either less frequent pulses or a lower amplitude of a pulse, this leads to lower FSH and LH secretion by the pituitary and leads to a low estrogen state at the level of the ovary. What's important is that, you know, although the classic findings would be to do an FSH and an estradiol level that are all undetectable, in some patients we may find that their estradiol level is undetectable, but their FSH level may be inappropriately normal on the low end of normal, not flagging as abnormal, um, but we would expect it to be higher to uh, help increase their estradiol level and their hypothalamus is not responding appropriately. The important thing about our disorders of the hypothalamus though, is that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So unless your patient is a known patient with anorexia nervosa, for example, and under intensive eating disorder treatment, we wanna take a good history for our eating disorders and our excessive exercise, but ensuring that we're ruling out the other etiologies that we're going to discuss. A good flag uh, question for eating disorders for patients in our clinic is, if you ask a teenage patient, how many calories do you eat a day? And they have a number for you, that might be a bit of a warning sign and get you to delve into their eating patterns a bit more. Uh, for our patients with excessive exercise, most of us are probably familiar with the old terminology a female athlete triad, which has now been renamed to relative energy deficiency in sport, or red S. And the change in terminology really shifts the focus from the energy balance. You know, some of our uh, patients aren't doing a crazy excessive amount of exercise, and it's more that they're just not intaking enough calories to balance their energy needs. Um, and so it's a bit more of an all-encompassing diagnosis. Certainly, there are certain sports that all of us think of when we think of these excessive exercise patients, our ballet dancers, our gymnasts, our runners. These are certainly ones that are more predisposed to this, uh, but the tipping point on the scale is different for each patient. The other important piece to remember for our patients who have eating disorders and excessive exercise is that the weight that they must obtain in order to regain their menstrual cycles is often higher than the weight that they were at when they lost their menstrual cycles. And this can be a really difficult concept for some of these patients to grasp, particularly those eating disorder patients. Moving down to the anterior pituitary, uh, this can, there are also etiologies at this level that can cause irregular cycles or secondary amenorrhea. Pituitary tumors are one of the most common uh, causes of amenorrhea, and pituitary tumors can fall in one of two groups. Either they can be a tumor on the pituitary that is secreting a hormone, 
the most common being a prolactinoma. Or it can just be a tumor on the ovary that's not functional, but a space-occupying lesion that can either um, be compressing on the pituitary stalk, affecting the signaling from the hypothalamus to the pituitary, um, or interfering with the delivery um, along the HPO axis. There can also be other masses in the surrounding area that may compress the anterior pituitary or pituitary stalk, so malignant tumors or infectious lesions. Our anterior pituitary can also be affected by damage from previous surgery or radiation, infiltrative diseases, and highly unlikely in our adolescent population, but Sheehan syndrome after a postpartum hemorrhage. At the level of the anterior pituitary, one of our more common diagnoses is likely hyperprolactinemia. And hyperprolactinemia can be caused by a number of things. You could have a prolactinoma on the anterior pituitary that is secreting prolactin. You may have other lesions compressing the pituitary stalk and leading to hyperprolactinemia. Or patients might be on medications, and usually we think of a lot of our antipsychotic medications. Um, that may lead to hyperprolactinemia. Depending on the level of the prolactinemia will affect the, how this manifests on their menstrual cycles. So if they have mild hyperprolactinemia, we might notice just a small alteration in their menstrual cycle length, uh, whereas patients who have a much higher level of prolactin would be frankly hypogonadic with low estrogen levels and completely amenorrheic. It's important to remember that not all of our patients with hyperprolactinemia uh, will present with galactorrhea. And so given that this can be a common cause of irregular periods, it's important that all of our patients presenting with irregular menstrual cycles and secondary amenorrhea have a screening prolactin level completed. If the prolactin is mildly elevated, uh, it's important that we repeat this before proceeding with um, pricey neuroimaging. So our recommendations for prolactin levels are getting it done first thing in the day, low stress environment, no breast stimulation beforehand, no hot showers. Um, and in a lot of cases, our prolactin level normalizes with this and no further testing is needed. Moving down our HPO access to the level of the ovary, our diagnoses at the level of the ovary fall into two big groups. The first are those that cause chronic anovulation, and these patients often have normal FSH, LH, and estradiol levels. So this would include our very common PCOS, uh, obesity, thyroid disease, both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, and mild hyperprolactinemia. The other big group of diagnoses at the level of the ovary is premature ovarian insufficiency, which some people may know as premature ovarian failure, which is the old term that we used to use. This is more uh, classified on labs with an elevated FSH in the menopausal range and an undetectable estradiol level. And so just to delve into PCOS for just one minute, we are all familiar with this. We've all seen patients with this. It's one of the most common endocrinopathies in premenopausal women. PCOS is characterized by increased androgen production at the level of the ovaries, and this leads to irregular periods and often clinical hyperandrogenism. For a lot of patients with PCOS, they also have significant insulin resistance and are at high risk for metabolic syndrome. One of the important things to remember is that non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia can mimic PCOS. They also get irregular periods. They also get hyperandrogenism, and so for our patients who are presenting with a phenotype more concerning for PCOS, we want to ensure that we are screening for the much less common CAH uh, to rule this out. To diagnose PCOS, most of us use the Rotterdam criteria, where you need two of three criteria uh, in adults. Irregular periods, clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism, and polycystic morphology of the ovaries on the ultrasound. But one of our other big takeaway points from the talk today is actually that ultrasound criteria can't be used in patients who are less than eight years from menarche. A lot of teenagers have ovaries that appear polycystic on an ultrasound, and that's normal physiology. 
And it's not uncommon for our pediatric gynecology clinic to get referrals for patients for exactly this reason. They had an ultrasound and showed PCOA-like ovaries. Some of these patients are coming in, they have regular periods. They don't have any of the other Rotterdam criteria. And so the Escher guidelines from uh, Europe uh, make it clear that ultrasound criteria should not be used less than eight years from menarche. And um, as we'll conclude a bit later, there really is no other indication for an ultrasound in adolescents that are presenting with irregular periods. The last group at the level of the ovary is our premature ovarian insufficiency. And they changed the terminology from premature ovarian insufficiency to be a little less harsh from the word failure, but also because this is on a continuum of decreased ovarian function, resulting in irregular periods and often secondary amenorrhea and reduced fertility. This often occurs when patients have few or no follicles left um, that are able to produce estrogen in response to FSH and LH. It afflicts approximately 1% of females under the age of 40. And as mentioned before, the hallmark findings on laboratory uh, testing is a really elevated FSH and a low estradiol. If these findings are present, we recommend repeating this at least four weeks later to confirm the diagnosis. Patients can enter premature ovarian insufficiency at any point, during embryonic life, during childhood before puberty occurs, after puberty starts but before menarche, or at some time between then and the age of 40. And so how the patient presents may be different depending on what age this occurred at. For patients with premature ovarian insufficiency, we are able to find an underlying etiology in only 5% of patients, with the other 95% deemed idiopathic. So within those 5% of patients, it can sometimes be caused by gonadal dysgenesis or other chromosome abnormalities, fragile X premutation, autoimmune causes, or if they've had some oncologic treatment. So how do we investigate our teenagers? Well, in the Peds Gynae Clinic, our group has a consensus that we kind of draw a line in the sand for our patients who are less than three years from menarche or those who are more than three years from menarche. For those who are less than three years from menarche, where irregular menstrual cycles can be quite common, we really limit our investigations and proceed with observation. And so if our patient is presenting with heavy periods, we would recommend completing the CBC and ferritin level, a screening TSH, uh, just to rule out thyroid disease, and a beta HCG if it's applicable to your patient. That being said, if you're in within those first three years from menarche, but your patient is presenting with significant clinical hyperandrogenism, like my question, do you have way more acne than your friends? Um, then we can consider doing testing for non-classic CAH as well as our androgen profile, because certainly we do see some PCOS phenotype appear quite early in. Certainly as a provider in Surrey, I can attest to this, um, that it certainly in the Southeast Asian population, we see it quite young. For our patients who are presenting in later adolescence and are more than three years from menarche, our workup is very similar to what we would do for an adult. One of the big things that we impress on people is that we want our labs done on day three of the menstrual cycle. So that's our FSH, LH, and estradiol. And often if you write day three on your lab requisition when you're providing it to the patient, the lab will actually transcribe that on the results, which is really helpful as the consulting specialist um, because sometimes patients don't remember if they did the blood work on a certain day of their period. Um, and then we'll complete the rest of our workup as well. And a reminder, um, really no indication for ultrasound in irregular periods in the adolescent population. Another thing that would work both as a diagnostic test and therapeutic is a progestin challenge test. And so what this involves is giving the patient a course of a progestin for 10 days and seeing if they have a withdrawal bleed when it is complete. Usually their bleeding should start within a few days of stopping the progestin. And what it tells us is that they have an endometrial lining inside that is growing under endogenous estrogen and this progestin causes that lining to come out. If we give the patients this progestin withdrawal and no bleeding happens, 
that tells us that they have a really, really low level of circulating estrogen, and there's no lining developing inside. It could also mean that they have an outflow tract abnormality, but like we said, that's less applicable to this age group. If you give them the progestin and they do not have bleeding, then uh, you have the option of repeating this test, but giving them an estrogen containing medication. So either giving them an oral contraceptive with at least 30 micrograms of estradiol or giving them standalone uh, estrogen uh, followed by a progesting course to cause a withdrawal bleed. So what are our goals for management? What are the things we should be thinking about when we have these patients in our office? And we're gonna kind of go through each of these. So the first is endometrial protection. So although our you know, adolescents are generally young and healthy, in the long term, we want to prevent overgrowth of the endometrial lining, and we want to prevent or decrease the risk of endometrial hyperplasia or malignancy. And so our minimum requirement is that our patients have a period at least every three months. And so if our, period, our patients are spontaneously having periods more frequently than that, then we have an option to just wait and observe as long as they're having a cycle every three months. But for those patients who are going longer stretches without periods, options that we might have for endometrial protection would be giving them a course of a progestin to take every three months if they don't have a spontaneous period on their own. Or we can give them a cyclic progestin so that they have a withdrawal bleed every month. We can give them a combined hormonal contraceptive, a pill patch ring. We could give them a progestin only pill. We could give them a RENA IUD, uh, which would protect their endometrium. And kind of separate would be our patients with premature ovarian insufficiency actually need full hormone replacement therapy. A few notes in terms of choice of a combined hormonal contraceptive in this population. Well, what we know is that when we're choosing a pill, that we want to choose one that has at least 30 micrograms of ethinyl estradiol. And this is because studies have shown that with a pill that has 30 micrograms of ethinyl estradiol, the effect on the bone mineral density is either stable or improved. And we're in a period of time of peak bone accrual. And so these days in BC with free contraception, if you go onto the government of BC website, they have a full list of exactly which oral contraceptive pills are covered and what is the dose of the estradiol in it. Um, and so choosing one that has 30 micrograms is ideal. Um, the other piece related to a combined hormonal contraceptive is thinking about the progestin that is in it. And so this is just kind of a simple chart that lists the different progestins in many of the pills that we have on the market and what the androgenic level is. And where I find this plays the most is, you know, for patients, particularly those with a PCOS phenotype, um, who are presenting with significant acne and hirsutism, where we might lean towards choosing a pill that has a progestin that either has low androgenic activity or anti-androgenic. So for example, drospirinone as a progestin, which is commonly found in ones people might be familiar with, or Yaz and Yasmin, is more anti-androgenic and maybe a more popular choice. And um, there are um, some generics available through to through the uh, free contraceptives in BC. And one of our other goals that might be important to our patients is the predictability of bleeding. So while we might say, oh, you're in your first three years after your period, irregular periods can be normal. You know, this might be unsettling for some of our younger patients who are anxious about getting their period when they're at school and it might just show up completely surprised. And so for some of those patients, while their body might mature, and their HPO axis mature and their periods become regular, they want something to manage their irregularity in the interim. And so using a cyclic progestin or a combined hormonal contraceptive or even a Mirena IUD to keep them amenorrheic during this time um, might be a good option for these patients. There's been also more talk and consideration recently about bone health in this group. And as I alluded to before, you know, this is a period of peak bone mass accrual. And so the two groups that we really want to think about are those who have like a hypothalamic dysfunction. So our eating disorders, our chronic diseases, our excess exercise, who have a low estrogen state, um, as well as those who have premature ovarian insufficiency. 
And so for these patients, if you know, we're trying to treat their eating disorder, we're trying to treat their exercise, but as we all know, these aren't things that are often quick to resolve. It leads to them being hypoestrogenic for a long period of time. And so recently there's been a shift towards, you know, following these patients with bone mineral densities and or providing them some hormone replacement, not with an OCP, as this can be detrimental to many of these patients, but providing them hormone replacement with what I'll call menopausal hormone therapy, our transdermal estradiol or our uh, estrace, um, to help support their bone health while they're working on their recovery. And um, the other piece uh, for these patients, obviously, is also making sure they're getting uh, adequate calcium and vitamin D to support their bone health during this time. Um, we're probably all more familiar with this aspect, but also ensuring that if our patients require contraception, that this is being considered uh, in their goals for management. And obviously, treating their underlying cause that's causing the amenorrhea in the first place, their eating disorder, um, their exercise balance, their hyperprolactinemia, and particularly for our patients with PCOS, really implementing lifestyle changes, um, especially as we know this is a young um, you know, population that if we instill good habits in them now, uh, they will hopefully continue on these lifelong. And even having up to 5% of weight loss in some of our patients with PCOS will lead to regulation of their menstrual cycles and can improve fertility down the road. And so important not to forget this, uh, even when OCP is usually our first go-to. So to summarize, irregular periods are common in the first few years after menarche. Uh, generally, we recommend uh, withholding hormone investigations unless there's overt clinical hyperandrogenism until they're more than three years after menarche. Currently, there's no indication to order ultrasounds in adolescents for investigation of irregular cycles. Um, when choosing an OCP, preferentially choose a pill that has at least 30 micrograms of ethinylestradiol and think about bone health and refer to us if you have concerns. And this is just a plug that um, NASPEG, which is the North American Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, has an excellent patient handout section for irregular periods, concerns about pills, painful periods, et cetera, that may be helpful to you guys in your office uh, when seeing patients with these concerns. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Justice. That was one, that was a really wonderful review. We see so many patients with irregular periods. So um, because you're the last speaker, uh, I know that we are um, just uh, at, at the end of our time here, but I think it'd be most efficient to ask you these questions out loud if you don't mind. Um, sure. So the first one is I've had younger patients with obesity, um, age 25 to 29, nine. they try to lose weight to infer, improve fertility pregnancy outcomes. Um, and they did end up with amenorrhea, not pregnant, because they're low calorie diets to lose weight. Um, and then they reach their weight goal, they stop their calorie deficits and their periods return and they conceive within a few months. I'm curious though, if their calorie deficit is such that they're getting amenorrhea, is this considered too aggressive of a calorie deficit for them? Or should I be testing if they're truly anovulatory prior to deeming their calorie deficit too much? Yeah, so I mean, it's it sounds like in the end, these patients are kind of reaching their ultimate goal, which is regulation of their periods and getting pregnant. Um, you know, I would say that we often don't do testing to determine if they're anovulatory, um, like while undergoing their treatment in their weight loss. Um, you know, they're it's hard to say. Often patients go away and then they come back to us. Um, and so, yeah, I would kind of just follow. And, you know, if they get to a period of amenorrhea and then they stop those activities and their periods resumed, I probably wouldn't do any further testing. Um, but if they're, you know, continuing to work on weight loss and remaining in uh, amenorrheic for a long time, I would have testing completed. Or if when they've kind of um, pulled back on their calorie deficit, if their periods don't re return, I would go with testing. Okay. Okay. Um, and then they said to continue with the above question in patients with hypothalamic dysfunction from athleticism or to, um, or to, uh, low calories when their activity or calorie intake normalizes, um, is there any further impairment for fertility ovulation? So basically they were hypo hypo. Now they're not anymore. Um, 
Yeah, I think, and Dr. Dunn might be able to add to this, but certainly I think we see patients who have a profound eating disorder or profound athleticism that even once they've recovered from those activities, we sometimes still see some hypothalamic dysfunction that's lifelong, um, that they're, you know, the hypothalamus is really quite sensitive. Um, that that's my understanding, but you would know more of the fertility implications. Yeah. And I think we can sometimes see that their endometrium gets really thin. Um, and if they've been hypo hypo for a long time, particularly if it started in their teens and they never really developed like that cyclical endometrium, we'll see these really thin patients with really thin endometrium, despite having normal cycles. And I, I don't know where that comes from. Is it because it didn't develop normally? Is this their natural propensity? Are they making estrogen, but not enough? Um, but we, yeah, we can see some residual. Um, okay, how reliable is FSH-LH ratio in PCOS diagnosis? Do you see a lot of false negatives? Yeah, so I would say in, in my training, um, we've really shifted away from using the FSH to LH ratio in the diagnosis. So most of us are using the Rotterdam criteria these days, or like the Society of Endocrinology um, has like a, a modified version of the Rotterdam criteria, for lack of a better descriptor. So I'd say most gynecologists aren't using that as a diagnostic criteria anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, if I could add to that, like the ESHRA criteria really, the newest ESHRA criteria 2023 was really pushing towards clinical diagnosis of PCOS. So without actually having to do any lab work, asking about irregular cycles and hirsutism. And then if you have that, you have the diagnosis. And then if you don't, then delving into doing the labs. Um, but, uh, but looking at that double the amount of LH, so that two to one, twice as much LH to FSH ratio is not part of the diagnostic criteria. Um, okay. Is there a prolactin level cutoff, which would prompt imaging? What about mild prolactin who have normal periods? Yeah, this is a great question. What if you see that prolactin that's like 32 or 40, you know, are you, and it's persistently. So like you talked about repeating with no chest stimulation early in the morning, you know, what cutoff are we ordering the head MRI? Yeah. So, I mean, certainly if you have a markedly elevated prolactin, that's like above 100, you know, even above 50, that's persistent. I would absolutely order the MRI and refer them to endocrinology at the same time. Um, I would say if they're very mildly elevated on repeat labs, my inclination would be to refer them to endocrine for further review and consideration of head imaging. Um, you know, the question about like for the patient with regular periods, I mean, I guess my question is why did we order that prolactin in the first place? Um, unless they're having galacteria. Um, but yeah, that would be my like market. I've often point. heard 50 as a cutoff, but I, it's not, I haven't seen it like, you know, consistently like on an imaging rack or anything. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, can you make a diagnosis of premature ovarian insufficiency based on AMH level? So that's not that's not the diagnostic criteria for premature ovarian insufficiency. Certainly, um, you know, AMH is a uh, test that has been um, sort of looking for validated for use in the infertility population, and we often extrapolate you know from it a lot. We're seeing patients in the office; they want to know where the fertility is at. They actually haven't tried to get pregnant, and so we're using it kind of a bit separately than that. And so I'd say for our premature ovarian insufficiency population, we wouldn't make the diagnosis with the AMH, but certainly we would expect it to be low and in support of a diagnosis of POI um, in those patients. Which specific findings or abnormalities in the workup would trigger me to refer to a, sub, uh, to a specialist for suspected non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia? Yeah, so non-classic CAH, presents almost identically to PCOS on a phenotype level. So they're presenting with, um, you know, hyperandrogenism. So acne, hirsutism, um, mm -hmm. may have hair loss. Um, and these patients, um, and so when they're presenting with those uh, that phenotype, we would order a 17-hydroxyprogesterone on our labs. And if this was elevated, I would refer to either pediatric gynecology or pediatric endocrinology uh, for further investigation. Okay. Do you have it in you to answer a few more, but we'll do rapid yeah. fire? Yeah. Okay. Um, can we do LH and FSH estradiol testing on any day of the cycle, especially with those with irregular periods, or do we wait and try to get a day three? Yeah. So for someone who's having periods, we would really recommend waiting and getting a day three. If their periods are really sporadic, like every six to eight months, for example, give them a course of Provera, induce a withdrawal bleed, and do the labs on day three. As gynecologists, we're really all trained and standardized to look at labs on day three where that's possible. 
um, because so many of those numbers kind of fluctuate so much in the month that, you know, interpreting them really random is sometimes really hard to interpret what's going on in their body. Okay. Um, in patients, uh, pediatrics, teens, adults, amenorrheic from calorie deficit because of anorexia, not yet in remission, do these patients need endometrial protection? Should I use medical strategies to achieve a period every three months? Um, and I think the, the next two questions are the same because you did reference a 30 microgram OCP um, and somebody is lower down is asking about the dose for adolescents with prolonged amenorrhea if they need estrogen. So I think I'm going to combine all of those questions because if you're going to talk about hormone replacement in these patients, then um, maybe you can answer the dose as well. Yeah, so um, just to kind of step back, so the 30 microgram of ethinyl estradiol uh, OCP is helpful and protective of bone mineral density in um, our patients who are not in like a stress state. So anyone who's, you know, you get um, you know, has PCOS, for example, um, a 30 microgram uh, OCP is protective. Um, in our anorexic uh, excessive exercise group where their body's in a state of stress, um, the 30 microgram pill can be detrimental to their bone health. And that's more related to the exact type of estrogen that is in an OCP. So a thionyl estradiol is less of a physiologic estrogen compared to our, like the estrogens that we would use for hormone replacement therapy or menopausal hormone therapy. And when we've looked at studies using, you know, a 30 microgram a thionyl estradiol pill in this group, and actually impairs bone development and formation, whereas a 17 beta estradiol like a patch or estrace uh, is beneficial. Um, okay. The other, I know there was like a two piece to that question, but it was more around dose. So if you're going to use a 17 beta estradiol like an estrace, um, what dose do you recommend? Is it like two milligrams a day or? Yeah, so we would be going for you know full hormone replacement for bone health. So. Um, if you were using a estradiol patch, using you know a 75 to 100 microgram patch to be changed twice per week, um, or uh, if you're using an S-trace pill, ideally two milligrams a day to help protect their bone health. Um, and then the other question was, yeah, in these patients, do we need to be protecting their endometrium? So if we're not giving them any of these estrogen formulations, you know, we would ultimately think that the etiology leading to their amenorrhea is giving them a really thin endometrial lining. So their, their risk for endometrial hyperplasia or overgrowth is probably very low. Um, you know, the consideration can be given to given uh, Provera every three months to cause withdrawal bleed, knowing that we're probably not going to get any bleeding. Um, you know, this is kind of confounded a little bit by that a lot of our eating disorder specialists in the pediatric population, you know, they treat the menstrual cycle as a vital sign. And so often, you know, separate from bone health, they don't want to give the patient an OCP that's going to make them cycle every month and, you know, think that their period's back. They give that as a goal to work towards. Mm -hmm. um, so if they need it for contraception, you know, absolutely. But, um, you know, so yeah, less of a worry in terms of our endometrial health, um, but you can give a progestin every three months, but knowing that you might not get much return from that. Um, okay, and then this is, we recommend soy and flax in perimenopausal years because of phytoestrogens to help with menopause symptoms. Curious if you know if these phytoestrogens have any beneficial detrimental effect in PCOS patients. Um, I will admit, I don't know much about that topic. Yeah, I mean, I think if the latest SOGC guideline, um, you know, does say there may be some evidence of benefit for soy in managing um, vasomotor symptoms of menopause. Um, but I, I mean, generally PCOS is sort of a lack of cyclicity to the estrogens. So I don't, I, I can't think of a theoretical benefit, but if somebody does, please raise your hand. Um, okay. And then um, do you have an explanation for random spotting some get around the time of ovulation? I don't. <laughs> I mean, I think physiologically, if you look at the hormone profile, there is a little dip in estrogen around the, um, the mid cycle um, that, can, that happens at the same time as the LH surge. So some people actually get a little bit of like PMS around mid cycle as well. 
um, if they're sensitive and that little dip in estrogen happens. So we think that it's probably just a, like a temporary destabilization of the endometrium. Um, uh, this is, uh, let's just finish yours. Um, next, tell us for the population where the traditional combined oral contraceptive is a problem for bone. Yeah, so, you know, Nextellus is newer to the Canadian uh, market, um, but, you know, Nextellus and similar type pills that have, you know, the E4, or the E2 in them are, you know, more popular in the European market. Um, and I went to the European Contraception Conference this year in Spain, and the data really isn't there for the impacts of those types of estrogen on bone yet. So I don't know if we know that it's harmful, um, but I don't know if we can say that it's protective. Okay. Uh, last question, Dr. Tess, as we've kept you. Um, what's your recommendation for contraceptive in the anorexic patient that you're starting on um, POI dose menopausal hormone therapy? Yeah, so I think, you know, in having worked with a lot of the adolescent medicine physicians uh, during my fellowship time, um, one of, I'd say the the more favorite ones would be using something like an intrauterine device. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you use a copper one or a hormone one, realizing that if you use one of the hormone ones, it may keep them amenorrheic. Um, but, you know, it might be like, you know, yes, we want to use their menstrual cycles of vital sign, but more important than that is that we don't want them to get pregnant. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're weighing right. our priorities so at this point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a question for me about patients 30 to 35, uncertain about egg freezing. Should they get AMH um, to guide the decision? Any other labs? This is a great question because sometimes people do AMH and it's it's normal and then they think, oh, I'm fine. Um, and then other times they get AMH and it's low and then they really panic. Um, AMH is not a marker of fertility in general. It's not a question of can you get pregnant or not. Lots of people out there are walking around with low AMHs and they get pregnant. It's not a marker of egg health. However, it is a marker of how many eggs you're going to get at IVF. So let's say, for example, you're 31 and the AMH is low. There's no prospect of you wanting a pregnancy in the near future or you want multiple kids so you want to preserve your fertility. If your AMH is low, you're going to get less bang for your buck on that IVF cycle if your ovarian reserve starts to decline. So I think it depends what you're going to do with that information um, and making sure that we, you know, we don't have to do it on everybody as like a general fertility test because we don't want people walking away saying, I'm fine, but we also don't want to cause panic. Um, I have to make one public service announcement. Chelsea Elwood texted me and she wanted everybody to know, there's still lots and lots of people on this conference, um, that hepatitis C testing as of January 2025 is going to be recommended for everybody in their first trimester. And she forgot to mention that she wanted to tell everyone.